Hello, hello, how's it going? Hi, everyone. Wow, thank you so much for being here. Um, I was just talking to Liz Morgan, um, my coworker from Theater of the Oppressed NYC, about how we were originally going to host this event at the TOMYC office, which has a maximum capacity of 25 people. And I was so worried about filling that room. So I'm so grateful that the People's Forum agreed to host us here so we could have so many more folks in the room and on our live stream as well. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Max. My pronouns are he, him. I am the Director of Communications at Theater of the Oppressed NYC. Um, this event has come together with the help of many, many people, um, many of whom are in the room tonight. Radical Evolution, um, I want to thank friends of Ashtar NYC, um, Ashtar themselves, of course, um, and uh, the People's Forum um, for helping us out, as well as the Palestinian youth movement who can't be here tonight because they're hosting a vigil in Columbus Circle, but have sent along some remarks for us to read. Um, I don't have much prepared to say here, um, other than thank you so much for coming. This event has come together in like two and a half weeks, and I just want to recognize how amazing it is that all of you decided to be here in person tonight. You could have been doing anything else, but you decided to come here. I think that really speaks to the power of theater and art and mobilization and people uniting around a common cause. So I want all of us tonight as we experience this event to think about how powerful each of us is in our own way to organize an event like this on such short notice and mobilize this many people to come out for it. I mean, I wonder what we could do in another two and a half weeks or in a month or in a few months or in a year. I think all of us has immense potential to mobilize so many more folks around this cause, given how quickly this came together with just uh, a handful of folks taking the initiative. So um, there's one poem I want to share before I pass it off to our next speaker. This is, you probably heard it before, uh, We Lived Happily During the War. This poem is by Ilya Kaminsky. We lived happily during the war, and when they bombed other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. I was in my bed, around my bed, America was falling, invisible house by invisible house by invisible house. I took a chair outside and watched the sun. In the sixth month of a disastrous rain in the house of money, in the street of money, in the city of money, in the country of money, our great country of money, we, forgive us, lived happily during the war. Thank you again for coming out tonight. I'm going to pass it off now to Opa La Nietet, I'm so sorry, for our land acknowledgement. Hi ha 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 I am Opalanya Tet, also known as Little Eagle, and Ryan Pierce. I'm a member of the Nanakoke Leni Lenape Tribal Nation of New Jersey, and we are part of the larger Lenape diaspora, which includes the current island we are all standing and sitting on now, Manahatta, also known as New York City. My nation is one of the first nations of contact with Europeans and one of the longest continuous democracies on Earth. This land belongs to the Creator, yet it was given to the Lenape to be stewards of. 
This was and continues to be our land to look after as the many nations of the Lenape are still here. And while the Lenape have always welcomed people from all over the world to our shores, that invitation comes with a responsibility to treat everyone and everything on this land with respect. And I also want to um, say that, I mean, I, as, as a Lenape, um, I've been privileged to give land acknowledgments um, over, the past, over the past few years. Um, but I must say, none is more pertinent to what a land acknowledgment should be and the purpose of it than what we're doing right now. And I just want to tell just a real quick little story. Um, four years ago when I started writing a play about my tribal nation and how the state of New Jersey was treating us in the last decade, not one theater in and around New York City on the traditional lands of Lenape or on Turtle Island, North America, would touch that play, not one. The only one that would that took an interest, developed it, and gave it a first full production was a theater in Ramallah, Ashtar Theater. So, yes. <laughs> under, under the artistic direction of Iman Aoun. So, uh, Wanishi, thank you for this, and I look forward to the event. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Liz Morgan, uh, she, her. I work at Theater of the Oppressed NYC and I'm just here to read a short statement from Palestinian youth movement, New York City. We so wish we could be with you today to participate in the readings of the Gaza monologues. We are planning a vigil for the martyrs of the current genocidal campaign against Gaza at Columbus Circle this evening. But we know that the confluence of events and programs and protests across this city and country are having a direct impact on discursive support for Zionism, are draining mass amounts of city and state resources, and remain a necessary front in the struggle against Zionism and Western imper imperialism. Events like these are essential because they help to highlight the various elements of our struggle, from martyrdom to imprisonment, to siege and dispossession, particularly to the Arabs living here in the far diaspora who confront a Zionist project that attempts to disconnect and fragment the political Palestinian idea. Arabs have long understood the entanglements between our political commitments and our culture and have produced great works of theater, performance and, dan and dance as a means of revolutionary pedagogy, as a way of capturing energies and relating community knowledge and practice. From Jabra Ibrahim Jabra, to Ghassan Kanafani, to Sadala Wanus, revolutionary texts are given new life through decentralized networks of performance and assembly. We wish all the readers and attendees good luck in today's event. The Palestinian Youth Movement is the largest grassroots movement of Arab and Palestinian youth in the diaspora. If you would like to get involved with PYM or its national shutdown campaign, please reach out to one of the organizers of this event or visit the website shutitdown4palestine.org. For our part, we will continue to organize with our communities, workplaces, labor and student formations, and in the streets until liberation and return are achieved in Palestine. Thank you. Hi, my name is Leila Buck. Welcome, ahlan wa sahlan. I'm a writer, performer, and educator, and since 2011, I've had the privilege of spending time living and working in Palestine and witnessing the work of Ashtar Theater there. The welcome that I received from Iman and the whole company at Ashtar made me feel that I had a theatrical home and community in Palestine. I quickly learned that this was not unique to me. Their doors are always open to students, artists, international visitors, activists, family members, and friends. 
Ashdod is a company that is equally committed to creating powerful work that pushes artistic and political boundaries, supporting artists in developing to their fullest potential, and engaging with and nurturing community as an integral part of every step of their process. It is so clear when you enter Ashdod that this is a company connected to, woven with, and reflective of its community, and not just one small privileged sliver of its community, but a broad and deep spectrum of ages, gender identities, religions, socioeconomic classes, urban, rural areas, and everything in between. One of their forum theater shows that I experienced while there, The House of Yasmin, uh, used Yasmin, a newly incapacitated patient, as a character who embodied the state of Palestine and its relationship to international aid. The piece was absurdist, experimental, theatrical, funny. It engaged the audience throughout around when to seek and accept help when that life support is helping versus hurting us, and how we make choices not just to survive, but to thrive. The other piece I experienced while in Palestine, The Right and the Bracelet, was produced in partnership with Dan Church Aid and the YMCA in Ramallah through the fund from the European Union to support women in fighting for their legal right to inheritance given to them under Islamic law. Directed by Bayan Shabib, this forum theater piece engaged the audience throughout in questions of how to claim their rightful inheritance in the face of the social and cultural norms, leaders, and institutions that often attempt to deny us our legal rights, a dilemma that is faced by women all over the world, including here. The performance I attended was standing room only, filled to capacity with young women from universities and high schools from all over the West Bank, thanks to Ashtar's strong commitment to engaging and developing artists and youth from all over Palestine. I have jokered, performed in, and participated in various forms of theater of the oppressed and forum theater over the years, and I have never experienced the level of engagement and investment between company and community that I have through the work of Ashtar. I hope that tonight, as we hear from Iman Aoun, Artistic Director of Ashtar, Ali Abu Yassin, Director of the Gaza Monologues, and the youth who created these monologues with them, we will carry that same spirit of openness and welcome, of community, connection, and collaboration, as we reflect on how to support Palestinian youth, adults, artists, and communities here, there, and everywhere in this critical time, and always. I also want to note that in this moment, um, I would like us to think of solidarity with the Freedom Theater of Janine as well. Um, Janine is one of the places most impacted by the occupation on a daily basis, and that has intensified enormously since the attacks of October 7th. They are under constant siege by the Israeli army as we speak. Members of the theater have been arrested, attacked, and killed. The theater and its community are being terrorized at a level that is beyond words. I ask us to keep the people of Janine and the Freedom Theater in our hearts tonight as well, and to include them in our discussion of how we can support our friends, our colleagues, their families, their loved ones, and communities in this time. Um, and now I'd like to introduce, without further ado, a video from Iman Aoun, Executive Director of Ashtar Theater and creator of the Gaza Monologues, and a video from Ali Abu Yassin, Theater Director in Gaza. Hello, old and new friends of Ashtar Theatre and Palestine. I would like to thank you all for being with us on this call. I am Iman Oun, co-founder of Ashtar Theatre, creator of the Gaza Monologues. When we did the Gaza Monologues back in 2010, we thought that that would be the first and last war on our people in Gaza. But alas, it did not work out. Therefore, there was another war, and another, and another, and it continued on and on and on for the last 17 years. At the moment, with all that you have seen in the media, and all that you have done in your countries, in your cities, still nothing on the ground is being changed. We 
as a small company in Palestine. We're trying to keep the voice of the people of Palestine and of the people of Gaza heard. And therefore, we are calling upon you that these monologues, they do not only go into your hearts and minds, but that these monologues will become a paveway for a real change, a real pressure on your governments to take action, action that will bring justice and long lasting solution for a sovereign state for Palestine, that the world will all agree to have and will all recognize the state of Palestine. Because through peace and with peace, we can all live as regular people. Thank you. Thank you for being with us on this call. And we are all together to save our humanity. سيدات والسادة الأعزاء أرسل لكم تحياتنا من غزة الحزينة والموشحة بالسواد والتي لا زال شبح الموت يخيم على سمائها أما بعد أرجوكم أن تدلوني على طريقة أستطيع بها أن أهرب من كل هذا الموت أوجدوا لي حيلة أقنع بها أطفالي أن يناموا دون خوف ودون أن لا يستيقظوا مفزوعين يصرخون بجنون في كل ليلة وكل أغاني الكون وأحضان الأمهات لا تسكت صراخهم وصوت الزنانة لا يتوقف فقدت الثقة بكل المفردات التي لا تساوي دمعة أم على ابنها أو صرخة كهل على بيته المدمر الذي أبنى حياته يبني به وكأنه وطنه الصغير كيف أقنع عيوني التي تعودت أن ترى غزة الجميلة أن تراها الآن؟ غزتي تنزف نعم غزتي لأنني شاهدتها وهي تبنى حجرا حجر كنت أفرح حينما يرصف شارعا أو يبنى مطعما كل ذلك دمر وقتلونا دون أن يرف لهم جفن دم بكل مكان أرجوكم ساعدونا على وقف هذا النزيف الممتد منذ عام 1948 وإلى الآن بدت أشك بقدرة العالم على لجم إسرائيل من استعبادنا وتصميمها أن تعاملنا كعبيد ووحوش لا يستحقون الحياة ولم لا؟ وهناك الآلاف من قرارات الأمم المتحدة لصالح فلسطين لا زالت بالأدراج وإسرائيل تضرب بها عرض الحائط قولوا لي كيف ستساعدوننا من أجل أن ننال حريتنا نحن آخر شعبا في الأرض لا يزال تحت الاحتلال لقد تعبنا من الشجب والاستنكار وإعادة الكلمات الميتة والممجوجة حول الاحتلال وبشاعته والموت بنا لا يتوقف دعونا من الكلمات وهيا بنا إلى الأفعال فشعبنا دفع الثمن أضعافا مضاعفة فما دفعناه يحرر كل شعوب الأرض مرات ومرات نشعر أن القدر أصبح ضدنا ساعدونا على تغيير أقدارنا أقسم لكم بأننا بشر مثل باقي شعوب الأرض لدينا المبدعين والأطباء والشعراء والحالمين والكارهين والعاشقين والنساك والتعساء نحن كباقي شعوب الأرض لا تخافوا منا لا تقتلونا أوقفوا أحدث آلات القتل والتدمير على أطفالنا ونساءنا وشيوخنا وشبابنا نحن نستجير بكم أنقذونا أو اقتلونا فلا طاقة لدينا بعد الآن لنتحمل المزيد من كل هذا العذاب شكرا لإصغائكم And now the Gaza monologues
رقم 30 ياسمين أبو عمرو مواليد 1996 حي الشجاعية نفسي أكون متخصصة في علم الميتافيزيقية علم ما وراء الطبيعة تعرفوا ليش؟ لأني بعتقد أنه غزة بحالها وراء الطبيعة وأنا استفدت من وجودي في غزة وحابة أنقل خبرتي للآخرين مخيم الشجاعية دائما مركز الأحداث كل ما الاحتلال بده يقتحم غزة بشرف من عند دارنا ولما بدأت الحرب الناس تركت بيوتها لأنه كالعادة الشجاعية لازم تاكلها وطبيعي في هالحالة نترك بيتنا كل العالم تتصل في أبوي تقنعه يترك البيت إخوتي من الجزائر إخوالي من أمريكا عمومي من عنقرة كل العالم تترجف أبوي هو راكب راسه مش راضي يترك الشجاعية ثلاثة أيام وأمي مضبط بغراض الدار وإحنا في حالة سفر موقوف بدنا نروح على دار أختي لأنه هناك أأمن وبعد ما غلبنا معه في الحكي وافق وكلنا أنتوا روحوا وأنا بلحقكم كيف بدنا نروح ونتركه أمي ذكية تركت الخبز في البيت وأنتوا عارفين قديش الخبز كان عزيز في الحرب من حد ما وصلنا دار أختي اتصلت معاه وحكت له يا سلمان نسينا الخبز شبلنا إياه وفعلا وقع سلمان بالفخ وجاب الخبز وما خلينا يطلع ثاني يوم صباحا صحينا على صاروخ فوسفور عبق الشارع كلنا صرنا نبكي ودموعنا بتنزل من الفوسفور وكان الصاروخ أهون علينا من شتامة بابا فينا صار يقلنا قلت لكم خلونا في دارنا أحسن لنا الواحد ما بتتحملوش غير داره وخدوا يا كلام واللي زاد التين بلي إنه الجامع والدار اللي جنب دار إختي انهدموا من القصف والباقي عندكم إيش أبوي عمل فينا صار بده يرجعنا على الدار فورا ما لحق يخلص كلامه إلا بلغونا إنه البيت اللي جنب دارنا في الشجاعية انقصف وواجهة دارنا طارت وقتها لأول مرة كلنا طلعنا على بابا ظلينا قاعدين عند دار أختي صار واضح لنا إنه وين ما كنا في غزة في الحرب إحنا مش بأمان بعد الحرب صرت دايما لابس نظيف ومرتب على الآخر عشان لو متت أموت موتة حلوة بس بيكون أكبر مشكلة لو خبطوني صاروخ لأنه رح أصير ميت شقفة وأنا حابة أموت شقفة وحدة يا سلام على غزة وأحلام غزة صار حلمنا نموت موتة حلوة مش نعيش عيشة حلوة شكرا I will be reading this same monologue that was just so beautifully presented in Arabic in English. This is monologue number 30. The writer is Yasmin Abu Amer. It's translated from Arabic by Fida Jiris. Yasmin was born 1996 in Al Shujaiyah. I want to be a specialist in the science of metaphysics, 
what is behind nature. You know why? Because I think that Gaza itself is behind nature. And I got so much from my presence here in Gaza that I'd like to transfer my skill to others. The Shuja'iya camp is always the center of events. Each time the occupation wants to invade Gaza, they pass by our house. When the war began, people left their houses thinking that Shuja'iya would be hit. It's normal in this case to leave our house. Everyone was calling my dad to convince him to leave the house. My brothers from Algeria, my uncles from the States, my uncles from Ankara, the whole world was begging my dad and he wouldn't budge, refusing to leave the Shuja'iya. Three days with my mom having packed the house stuff and we were suspended in travel mode. We want to go to my sister's house because it's safer there. After we were exhausted from talking, he agreed and said, you go, I'll follow. How can we go and leave him? My mom was smart. She left the bread at home, so you know how dear bread was when the war. As soon as we got to my sister's house, she called him and said, Solomon, we forgot the bread. Bring it for us. And Solomon fell in the trap and brought the bread, and we wouldn't let him leave. The next morning, we woke up to a phosphorus bomb that fumed the street. We all started crying, our tears falling because of the phosphorus. The bomb was easier on us than Dad's taunting. He said, I told you, let's stay home. It's better for us. There's no place like home. And on it went. What added fuel to the fire is that the mosque and the house next to my sister's house were destroyed in the bombing. And you can imagine what my dad did to us. He wanted to take us back home immediately. No sooner had he finished his words than we were told that the house next to ours in Shujaiya was bombed and the front of our house ripped off. Then for the first time, all of us looked at dad. We stayed at my sister's place. It became clear to us that wherever we were in Gaza, in the war, we were not safe. After the war, I always started to dress in a very clean and tidy way, so that if I die, I would die a nice death. But it would be the biggest problem if I was hit by a rocket, because I'd become a hundred pieces, and I'd like to die in one piece. Wow, Gaza, and Gaza's dreams. Our dream has become to die a good death, not live a good life. I'll be reading monologue number nine, written by Tamid Najim, born in 1993 from Ashikh Radwan. This is translated by Fidra Jidius. Gaza is a matchbox, and we are the matches inside of it. When the war started on Gaza, all the media was focused on us. Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, and all the satellite channels were focused on Gaza, and the occupation wouldn't leave us alone. The whole world became busy with Gaza and what's happening in it. Suddenly, Al Jazeera wrote, breaking news, death of Muhammad al-Hindi. And it wasn't normal. Because that Muhammad, he's my uncle. My mother's brother. It was the first time I see the screaming move from live broadcast on TV to the house. Screaming and yelling and tears, all of it mixed up together, and it moved from our house to the street, and my mom fainted. A while later, the phone rang. It was my second uncle calling to tell us that Muhammad was martyred. 
he didn't know that the whole world knew the news. This television is awful. Before a person is shot, as the bullet is on its way to his chest, the television has already broadcasted the news. But these days, the channels are sitting idle, praying to God to send another war to Gaza so they have work. Anyway, we started crying bitterly for my uncle and remembering him and talking about him. We kept talking about him for a long time. Then it started getting less, because death became normal in Gaza. After the war, I stopped caring whether I live or die. After we saw, after what we saw in the war, I don't care about anything, because I think each day I live is the biggest bonus. And all the life I live after the war is extra because I could have died at any second. You know, I'm sick of the city, even though I love it. And I'm sick of the people, too. Sometimes I feel that I know the million and a half who are in Gaza. There's nothing new. The same day is repeated every day. I feel like traveling, like changing scene and faces. As soon as I wake up every morning, I see the electricity pole in my face. I wish I'd wake up one day and not find it there. Each day, Abu Ibrahim stands at the door of the supermarket, and Abed, the bean seller, is selling his beans, and Abu El Abed is sitting at the door of his house, afraid that his house would run away. Um Ibrahim is standing with Um Hassan. I know the taxi drivers one by one. I know who takes you to the city and who goes to the beach. It's soul draining. The only hour that's different in my life is the one when I come to theater practice. It became my work and mission. I wait for it impatiently. Without the theater, I would have gone crazy. When I grow up, I want to be a big actor. I loved acting since I was a kid. But any institution that I used to go to when I was a kid would throw me out a few days later. This time, it's different. I will be reading monologue number six by Amjad Abu Yassin. Um, they were born in 1993, and they are from the Ashate camp. And this was translated by Fidha Jirius. A day before the war, Gaza for me was joy and happiness, trips and going to the sea. Life seemed to be happy and I wasn't thinking about anything. I had one dream, that Gaza would develop in art and sports. I felt that everything was fine except these two things. But it turned out nothing was fine. No art, sports, health, or safety. It's all the same. Gaza stopped being the city of my dreams because my dream is to be an actor. Am I going to be an actor for 20 people in Gaza? And wait till the border opens? If it was in my hands, I would try as much as possible to reduce wars, death, and violence. It's a shame for every drop of blood that falls on the ground. I hate the silence and the abnormal tolerance that people have. I wish all Gaza would wake up tomorrow and walk the streets shouting loudly, enough! When the war started, 
We were playing football and the atmosphere was strange. The sky was red. Suddenly we heard the sound of a plane. I never heard a sound like that. We were all scared and lay on the ground waiting for death. After that, we heard the sound of a loud explosion meters away from us. We started looking in each other's faces and silently saying goodbye. Turned out the bombing wasn't meant for us. It was targeting a car of wanted men on the road above. But we kept lying, waiting for the second rocket. And all I could think of was my two older brothers who were with me. I was more afraid for them than for myself. And I think they also felt the same way. I carried my sports shorts and ran away from the field. As I ran, I stepped on a piece of shrapnel. I took it out of my leg and went out onto the street and saw them. They were three martyrs, and you couldn't make out their features. The first one's legs were on fire. He was looking at me and I at him. Among everyone there, he was warning me about something I didn't understand. It was then I saw he was warning me about a car coming fast towards us. Then I knew the real meaning of death. And instead of there being three martyrs, there could have been four. I was shocked at the scene. I stood there watching, and when I woke up after passing out, I ran home. The war came and went, and we're still living it. The victims are always the poor people who have nothing to do with anything. Even when there's an earthquake or a flood in any country, the victims are the poor people, as though there's a universal conspiracy against them. After the war, everyone started lying to everyone else. Lies, cheating, dishonesty, deceitfulness. For positions and interest, the leaders and powerful people commit slaughters and crimes without batting an eyelid or feeling any guilt. Poor people get poorer and sick ones sicker. I've lost trust in all mottos. The biggest speech from the biggest leader is bullshit. All speeches in the world don't warm up a cold person or someone sleeping in a tent after the war. The crisis is that the whole world is watching us as though there's nothing going on. And they're still making speeches. Monologue 18 by Fatima Abu Hashim, born 1996, Al-Jala Street. لما بحكي مع أطفال فلسطينيين في أوروبا بحزن عليهم. ما بتمنى أكون زيهم لأنهم في غربي. أحلامهم يزرعوها في أرض غير أرضهم والأحلام تكبر مع الناس والبلد. أنا بحب الحياة وبحب اللعب وبحب الناس وبتمنى أكون رئيسة فلسطين ليوم واحد لأعزز الحب والسلام بين الناس وإنهي الكره والحقد في قلوبهم وإنهي الإنقسام كان هيدا بيكون من أول قرارات الرئاسية بس للأسف أنا مش الرئيسة وعشان هيك صار في حرب استفتحنا بالحرب بقصف زي زخ المطر طلعنا من المدرسة نجري خايفين لقينا كل الدنيا بتجرف بالشوارع اللي بيدور على ابنه واللي بتدور على أخته واللي بده أمه كل الناس كانت تجري 
ورافعين رؤوسهم للسما بصراحه كان منظرهم غريب شفت وحده من بعيد لابسه بيجاما حافيه وبتجري اول ما شفتها ما عرفتها بس لما قربت منا ايه هي مرت عمي الشيك اللي ما بتطلع من البيت الا وهي على اخر ترز ساعتها اتاكدت الحرب قامت صار إلنا أكتر من سنة وإحنا بيسيرة الحرب عشناها ومنرجع من عيشة كل يوم بالتفاصيل لأنه التلفزيون والتليفون وجرس الباب كلها أشياء بتذكرني بالحرب وما بحبها بتعرفوا حتى جوالي رميته وأكتر شي بخاف منه الوحدة بصير فكر شو رح أعمل لو قامت حرب وأنا لحالي مين بده يحميني ولما بكون مع العيلة بصير فكر كيف بدي أحميهم كان عندي حلم كبير إني أصير ممثلة بس هالحلم صار يقل شوي شوي لأنه نظرة الناس للممثلة في بلدي مش إيجابية مع إنه التمثيل مهم بخليني إنقل صورة معاناة بلدي ومجتمعي للعالم عندي حلم تاني إذا ما زبط الأول إني أكون صحفية والحلم الثالث إني أكون أسرة أحبهم ويحبوني والرابع نصير أحرار وعلم فلسطين يرفرف في كل بلاد العالم والخامس إني أشوف العالم سعداء ما في موت ولا دمار ولا حرمان ولا حروب والسادس والآخر إني أخلص هالمونولوج وإنزل عن المسرح I am reading um, monologue 12 by Reem Afena, born 1996, Al Saft Awi Street. When I was young, I used to feel that I was the happiest child in the world. But the more I grow and my mind grows, the more my worry grows because I start to understand the things I did not. I started to know the meaning of a deprived child. The thing that upsets me and makes me cry the most are children's tears. All the children in the world, regardless of their nationality, religion, or color, when I grow up, I want to be a pediatrician. And that's the hope that gives me a big push in life. Even though I'm fed up, I'm bored and sad because Gaza doesn't have life anymore. Yesterday, I was sitting in school and I heard the sound of planes. I got really scared. I wanted to run away from school. I felt I was going to die because I remembered the war, the scenes of war won't leave my mind. On the third day of the war, my family was sitting together talking about what was happening in the war, and my grandmother was reassuring us so we wouldn't be scared. We were actually calmed, even though the sound of the rockets didn't stop. My grandmother's warm voice was calming us. 
And then the phone rang, and the lines were never caught in the war, so when we heard the sound of the phone, we were happy. Hello? Yes? This is the Israeli Defense Army. You have five minutes to clear the house. It's for your own benefit. You have been warned. I couldn't stand on my legs anymore. Everyone in the house started yelling. My grandmother was the first one to run away. It was the first time I'd seen her going so fast. My dad held me and my sisters and told us not to be scared. He was pulling me to leave, but I was going to die if I didn't take my teddy bear with me. I felt I had to have him and that I would betray him if I left him under the bomb. So I escaped from my dad's hands and I ran to my bear and I took him in my arms and I left. We all got far away from the house and sat down to wait for the five minutes. And they were the longest five minutes in history and they became 10. And we felt like they were years that passed. I was in a whirlwind. Thoughts and dreams were thrashing about in my mind and my head, and the world was spinning. I felt that the dream of being a doctor was very, very far away. I held the bear, and I remembered myself when I was small and how I was always laughing. I want to go back to being small. I want to stay small. I don't want to grow up. But the only thing that comforted me was the love of the people who didn't leave us for a moment. Gaza, Gaza is full of love. Monólogo número cuatro, Alá. Nació en 1996 en el barrio de al Shuhaye, traducido por Almontar. Tengo ganas de correr y correr y correr por las calles hasta que mi pañuelo vuele en el cielo y yo vuela con él. A veces quiero estar totalmente loca, pero no puedo. Es la primera vez que digo esto. Tal vez no son mis palabras, tal vez son las palabras que no puedo expresar, tal vez o tengo miedo a expresar. ¿Por qué mi familia me trata así? Miro a las chicas de mi edad, cómo están viviendo su vida, y les tengo envidia. Cómo me gustaría ser como ellas, con su libertad. Quiero un barco que me lleve a una isla lejana y tirarme en las orillas, lejos del mundo, lejos de todo, especialmente la guerra. Hablando de la guerra, la guerra es una cosa y lo que dice mi mamá es otra. ¿Por qué? Mi mamá me repite las cosas que yo ya he visto. Es algo que nunca entenderé. Ella y yo estábamos de pie en el balcón cuando bombardearon la casa de nuestros vecinos. Uno de los vecinos murió. Vimos cómo la casa fue destruida. Y un cadáver que voló a la calle. 
se pueden imaginar lo que sucedió con la familia después de eso. ¿Terminamos? No, todavía no terminamos. Mamá empezó a contarme cómo la casa de nuestros vecinos fue bombardeada y cómo nuestro vecino voló de la casa como si no hubiera estado yo con ella. Así eran las historias de mi mamá durante toda la guerra y yo su única oyente. Estamos sentadas viendo la televisión y ellos dicen que el bombardeo fue en algunas zonas. El reportaje dura 15 minutos, pero el repetido el reportaje de mi mamá dura dos horas. Ella habla sobre el reportaje como si no hubiera estado yo con ella. Empecé a dudar de mí misma. ¿Estaba sentada con ella, sí o no? Juro que yo estaba ahí. Yo estaba sentada realmente ahí. Yo estaba a un lado de ella. De todos modos, gracias a Dios que mi mamá ya no está con ustedes. De otra forma, les, les habría dado dolor de cabeza con sus historias. مونولوج 14 سامي الجرجاوي مواليد 1994 حي التفاح أكثر ساعة بكرهها بالنهار الساعة 12 الظهر وكل ما تبدأ أيام الامتحانات بحس إنه الحرب بدها تقوم من تاني بالامتحانات بعرفش أجاوب ولا على سؤال وبتطلها الأفكار تروح وتيجي براسي لحد ما أزهى وتساءل بيني وبين حالي هاد, هاد اللي بيصير معي طبيعي ولا أنا مريض الناس بيقولوا بحر غزة بغسل كل هموم بس أنا همي أكبر من البحر لأني لأني آخر مرة كنت في البحر كنت مع صاحبي سبحنا ولعبنا وانبسطنا بس هلأ بطلت أقدر أروح على البحر اسمع شو صار شارع التلاتيني عند محطة البترول الكاز عزيز وغالي عند الناس أخو أخته اللي عنده لتر كاز الدنيا حرب والناس خايفة تشتري إشي أبوي بعتني أشتري كاز بعد ما اشتريت رحت على دار صاحبي زكي اللي ساكن جنب المحطة عشان كنت مشتاق له كتير وصار لي كتير من أكتر من عشرة أيام مش شايفه صلت عنده وكنت مستعجل لأنه أبوي بده أرجع بالكاز بسرعة دخلت على دارهم من غير ما حتى أدق الباب لأنه أمه أصلاً بتعتبرني زي ابنها وأنا كمان سلمت عليها وعلى صاحبي وأخذته بالأحضان وبسته وسلمت على إخوته وطلعت بسرعة بعد ما صار بيني وبين بيتهم عشرين متر سمعت صوت طيارة عالي وبعدها صوت صاروخ بنزل على بيت صاحبي صارت الناس تزعق وتقول الدار انقصفت ما صدقتش تلفتت على دار صاحبي شفت نار ودخان طالع من دارهم عمري ما شفت زي هيك رجعت على دارنا جري بس وصلت أبوي حكالي صاحبك استشهد لا صاحبي ما استشهد الناس كلها صارت تحكي لي صاحبك زكي استشهد وأنا مش مصدقهم عشان هيك ما رحت على الجنازة ولا على المستشفى ولا على المقبرة لأنه زكي ما مات دايماً بالليل بتكلم معه أنه مش بالضبط معه بس يعني مع صورته أنا زعلان منه كتير لأنه ما بيجي يزورني وأنا كمان بطلت أزوره في البيت أنا متأكد أنه هو مش ميت وأكيد رح يرجع يوم ونتقابل وقتها رح ألومه لأني مشتاق له كتير اللي صاحب تاني عايش في روسيا ضل يحكي لي عن روسيا وعن الحرية والأمان اللي عايش فيهم بحس حالي مش عايش بصير أتمنى أغطس في البحر وأضل أغطس وأغطس وأغطس 
لحد ما أطلع ألاقي حالي في روسيا This is also monologue 14, written by Sami El Jarrawi, born 1994, Haya Tafah. The hour that I hate the most in the day is 12 noon. Every time the exams start, I feel that the war will start again. I can't answer any of the exam questions, and thoughts keep floating around in my head till I'm sick of them. I ask myself, is what's happening to me normal, or am I sick? People say the Sea of Gaza washes all pains, but my pain is bigger than the sea. Because the last time I was at the sea, I was with my friend. We swam, played, and had fun. But now I can't go to the sea anymore. The Talatini Street is near the petrol station, and petrol was dear to people and expensive. It was a big deal to have a liter of petrol. There was a war going on, and people were afraid to buy anything. My dad sent me to buy petrol. After I bought it, I went to the house of my friend Zaki, who lives near the station. I was missing him a lot, and I hadn't seen him for more than 10 days. I got to his house, and I was in a hurry because my dad wanted me to return quickly with the petrol. I went inside their house without knocking the door. His mom considers me like her son, and me too. I said hello to her and to my friend, hugged him and kissed him, said hello to his brothers and quickly left. When there were 20 meters between me and their house, I heard the sound, the loud sound of a plane. And after that, the sound of a rocket falling on my friend's house. People started screaming that the house was bombed. I couldn't believe it. I looked back and my friend's house and saw fire and smoke coming out of it. I'd never seen anything like that. I went back running to our house. When I got there, my dad told me, your friend died. No, he didn't. Everyone started telling me your friend Zaki died, and I didn't believe them. That's why I didn't go to the funeral or to the hospital or the cemetery, because Zaki did not die. I always talk to him at night. Well, not exactly him, to his photo. I'm very upset with him because he doesn't come visit me, and I also stopped visiting him at home. I'm sure he's not dead, and for sure there will come a day when we meet. Then I'll blame him because I miss him so much. I have another friend living in Russia. He always tells me about Russia and the freedom and safety that he lives in. I feel that I'm not living. I start wishing that I would dive in the sea and keep diving and diving till I come out and find myself in Russia. This is monologue 29, Yasmin Jarur, born 1996, Aldaraj. Translated from Arabic by Fida Jurgis. Our future in Gaza is obscure and unknown, like a calm volcano that can erupt at any second. As if we're on a boat without a captain in the midst of a raging sea, we go right and left, and no one knows where to lean. I hear that in other countries, childhood is sacred and children live their lives without problems or fear. But Gaza's children are forgotten and outside the picture. They're the ones who feel the injustice the most because society treats them like they're not kids. When it wants, it makes them adults, and when it wants, it returns them to being children, and most people deal with them like they're only bodies, not minds. When I see a child peddling in the street or working in a shop, I imagine how the children of the world are playing resting and feeling safe. Honestly, my heart breaks for them and sometimes I cry. Gaza has no tenderness and no childhood. 
A boy is born a man here, and a girl is born a bride. Dad before the war was a lot more tender with me. I wish he would take me in his arms like before, but God help him, he's probably worried too. Because in the war, we lost five donums of land in a second. The field that's 60 years old was hit by a rocket from the Israeli army, which burned all the oranges in it. My father, my brother, and myself could have also died by that rocket because we were close to the window. If dad hadn't thrown me on the ground, all the shrapnel would have hit me. After the war, I visited Rafa Crossing and I saw the flags of Palestine and Egypt next to each other, yet separated by a wire. I felt the difference between the two flags and that this wire is the border of this big prison that we live in. I felt how stupid and unjust is the world. And I felt like breaking all borders and ending all differences between races and religions so that everyone in the world would be brothers. My dream became to live in a safe country, even in a small village, in a distant island at the end of the world. واحدة وعشرين محمد قاسم مواليد ألف وتسعمية وخمسة وتسعين شارع الصفطاوي كنا أنا وستي في البيت لحال كانت تحكي لي قصص عن أيام البلاد قصص بتضحك وقصص بتحزن بس ولا مرة حكت لي قصة كاملة لأن دائما في نص القصة بتروح على الحمام ستي نص وقتها في الغرفة ونص الثاني في الحمام أهلي رجعوا الساعة عشرة ونص بالليل وناموا على طول أنا ما عرفت أنا كنت متمدد على الفراش وصاحي بكتب الواجب فجأة سمعت صوت انفجار بعيد رحت على غرفة أهلي وأخذت الراديو لأسمع الأخبار صحيت أبوي من النوم وقلت له سمعت صوت انفجار قوي قال لي اسكت وروح نام هذا تفريغ هوا المهم رجعت على فرشتي وكانت الكهرباء مقطوعة فجأة صارت ضربة قوية زلزلت الدنيا أنا سحبت الحاف وغطيت وجهي وإشي وقع علي رفعت الحاف عني بكل قوتي كان إطار الشباك واقع علي والحاف مليان أزاز والدار كلها دخان أسود يومها قصفوا نقابة العمال اللي جنب بيتنا بالضبط بس مش هذا هو الموضوع الموضوع الشغلات الهبلة اللي صارت وأنا مش ملاقي لها تفسير أول إشي الدنيا مولعة وحاسين كلنا بدنا نموت وستي لخمتنا بتدور على ضبة سنانة خايفة لما تموت الناس يعرفوا انه ملهاش أسنان قال يعني مش عارفين لهلأ تاني شغلة الدار كلها دخان وأبوي ولع سيجارة ودخن قال يعني ناقصنا دخان تالت شغلة عمي تصل يتطمن علينا أبوي حكى له الحمد لله إحنا بخير بس كل شبابيك الدار تكسرت معادة واحد عمي حكى له اكسره وبالفعل أبوي كسر الشباك أنا مش عارف ليش بحكي هالقصة كل اللي بعرفه إنه إحنا عايشين في قفص في سجن مثل العصفور المحشور بده يطلع لكنه محاصر أطفال عم بتموت أمام عيون أمهاتهم تبكي عليهم القلوب وتصرخ بأعلى صوت بس ما حدا سامع 
ولا بشر حن ولا حدا اهتم Before the war, I used to feel that Gaza was my second mother. Its ground was the warm chest I could lay on, and its sky was my dreams without limits. The sea would wash away my worries. But today, I feel it's an exile. I stopped feeling It's the city of my dreams. In the war, the main electricity pole was hit by a huge rocket. All my uncles were at home with us, and the electricity went out. But there was another line working near the house. I went to our neighbor and asked him for an extension so we could connect to the second line. Once we were connected and our house was lit, he came to take the extension back. We had a huge fight. In war, Everyone thinks about themselves. During the war, a lot of people had 20 bags of flour and never had a shortage of gas, while others didn't have a piece of bread. They were asking their neighbors for bread, and they wouldn't give them any. Most people locked up their things under lock and key and decided not to give anything to anyone. But others were good and helpful. Back, back to our topic. We didn't agree to return the connection to him, even though it was his extension and we were, that we were using. And for the first time, I realized how bad we can be. We were punished on the spot. The house next to ours was bombed and split into two pieces, and half of it fell on us. We left the connection and electricity and everything and ran away to my uncle's house next to the uh, municipal park. My uncle's house is close to a government building, and in the evening, people started saying that building would be bombed. And if it was bombed, my uncle's house might disappear from existence. We sat there not knowing what to do or where to go. But my dad kept reassuring us, don't worry, don't be scared, nothing will happen. We stayed like that till midnight, and we kept hearing rockets and explosions and And my dad kept saying, don't worry, don't be scared. But suddenly, he said, follow me, we're going back home. And he started shaking, and all of us started shaking with him. My mom started screaming, and my uncle was in really bad shape. And anyway, all of us ran away in the middle of the night with my uncle's family. We ran home. <laughs> Couldn't believe it when we got home. Till today, I, I don't remember where we slept or how. The important thing was that we were away from that building. We found that our neighbor had taken the electricity connection and we spent the night in darkness while his house was lit. I felt he was right to take his connection back. After that, my dad got a connection complex. He bought three electric cables and six gas bottles, two electric pans, 20 neon lights, 20 packs of candles, six packs of cans, 10 packs of wires, six flashlights, and two boxes of batteries. We're living in a war, and we have to be careful till things get better. I got a complex worse than all others. It's as though I was generous before the war, or maybe I didn't know the value of things, but because I couldn't believe that there would be a day when I wouldn't find a drink of water or a piece of bread. But after the war, I became super careful with everything and anything. I started barely sweetening my tea. And if I broke a loaf of bread, I wasn't allowed to finish it. I, I lost my appetite for food and became really economical. My dad says, Ahmad always has his pocket money. Well, of course, because I take it and save it in case there is another war. I mean, I, I feel like I'm married with 10 kids. I'm scared of life, of everything, of the smallest things. Always, always worried. 
I feel that all of Gaza is sitting on moving sands. Any madness you can imagine can happen in a second in this place. And a lot of my dreams may come true, too. It's a strange city with, with no logic. But China is now a third of the world, and they all work but can barely make enough shoes and shirts for Gaza. Gaza consumes everything, and the world attacks it. But it keeps pretending nothing is wrong. Actually, Gaza is full of poverty. And there are people who pick their food from the garbage. The tragedy is that things keep getting worse. And the biggest tragedy is that there is nothing to stop that happening. Every pit has a bottom, except Gaza. I dream of living one day in freedom, and I, I don't think that's a big dream, but it's hard to come true. My dream is also to end the Palestinian division, which is giving us schizophrenia. I'm tired of thinking, but I can't stop it. But we have to plea, and God will provide. And to you folks, goodbye. That was Ahmad El Ruzi, born 1993. And that concludes our monologues for tonight. So let's hear another round of applause for our readers. Thank you. Um, that also concludes our live stream. So thank you so much to the folks who tuned in. Uh, before we open up the floor to the discussion portion of this event, I want to call attention to a few things in your program. Uh, the QR code on the front of this program will take you directly to Ashtar Theater's fundraiser for their psychosocial relief intervention program in Palestine. This is an amazing program, provides aid to youth in Palestine. It's an organization that's based in Palestine, providing aid to people in Palestine. So assisting a program like that, giving to a program like that, the importance of that cannot be overstated. Your money goes directly to them. Um, the monologues you just saw are not all of the monologues. I think it's important to name the fact that there have been new, monologue, new monologues added in just the last few weeks. Um, you can see those monologues on the Gaza Monologues website. The link is also in your program, gazamonologues.com. Uh, when we started putting this event together, the monologues were available in, I think, nine languages, and they're now available in 15. So um, many languages uh, on their website that you can read these in, you can put on your own event, your own reading. We hope that uh, this event will inspire you to take the monologues into your life and maybe produce another presentation of them. Um, the monologues are not the only thing we're here for. Um, so I want to open up the event now to an open discussion. Um, it's going to be facilitated by Beto O'Byrne from Radical Evolution. The idea here is that um, while these pieces are beautiful, they um, are meant to mobilize you into action. Um, and we want to give you the space to brainstorm ways to do that and to identify ways to do that. We've listed some resources in your program, but there are many, many more resources available, many more actions that you can take, many more ways you can organize, and many more organizers and activists that you can learn from. So, um, Peto, I want to invite you to the stage to facilitate our discussion. Thank you. <laughs> 